Okay, let, let me first start by introducing myself. Some of you already know me, I introduced myself. My name is Nick Montalto. I'm a lawyer here on Staten Island, and I'm also a CPA, a certified public accountant. I've been a lawyer for about over 40 years. Before practicing law, I was in the corporate field. I was the vice president and general counsel of a big advertising company. I was a manager at KPMG, Pete Mahler. And then I went to law school, became an attorney, and for the last 30 odd years I've been practicing law. I, my practice has been in almost every area of law. I've tried trial work, tried cases, I've done corporate work, pretty much you name it, I've done it. The last 10 years or so, I've kind of limited my practice pretty much to elder law and estate planning. And my purpose tonight is to basically give all of you a little information about what estate planning is, what elder law is, so that at least you have some information and you can make decisions for yourself. I'm not here to sell myself, to sell you anything, sell you my services. If you all have attorneys, that's great. Whatever I say, you might want to discuss it with them. Okay, if you want to discuss it with me, that's fine too. I say that because I know there are a lot of seminars that go on and unfortunately, sometimes uh, attorneys try to sell products or things like that. I'm not here for any of that. Okay, so we have a small setting, so let's try to keep it informal. Now, I gave everybody a little handout, which is basically just a rough outline of what I hope to talk about. Now, first of all, estate planning, just the word, basically all it really is is a plan that we make up so that when we die, however we want things to happen, they happen. While we're alive, if we get sick and we're disabled, things go the way we wish them to go. So let's start with basic estate planning needs. There are certain documents that everybody has to have, everybody should have. And those documents are basically a will, a durable power of attorney, a living will, and a health care proxy. And I'm going to try to explain all of those, what they are. So let's first start by talking about a will. Now, we talk about a will and what happens when we die. There are a lot of misconceptions. And some of what I'm going to read are things that I hear from people that call my office. A lot of people think, well, if I die, everything's going to go to my wife. A lot of people think, whatever I write in my will, it doesn't matter what anything else says. Whatever my will says, that's what's going to happen. That isn't necessarily true, and I'll explain in a while why. A lot of people think, I really don't need a will, I'll just write it up, I'll get it notarized, and that's it. A lot of people think, in order to make up a will, I could just write it out, get it notarized, and list everything I have in the will. Again, that's not true. People also sometimes think, i got to leave all my kids at least a dollar, I have to leave my wife so much, things like that. So let's start from the top. First of all, a will is simply a piece of paper, a legal document, that has certain formalities. It's a document made up which basically says that when I die, this is who I want to get my property, and it lists who they are. Now, under the law, you don't have to leave your children anything at all. You don't have to leave them a dollar, you don't have to leave them anything. The only person you must leave property to is your wife or your husband if you're married. And under the law, you have to leave them at least 50% of whatever law your property is. Now, if you don't leave them 50% and you cut them out, they have the right, when you pass on, to go to court, and the court will automatically give them 50%. Now, of course, like anything else, what I'm saying, there are exceptions to this. Sometimes people get married and they have things called prenuptial agreements. Many times in second marriages or marriages late in life, the people may decide, you know what, I want to be able to leave everything to my kids or the wife, I want to leave it to my kids, and they sign a paper saying that they could do that. But unless there is something like that, under the law, the wife or the husband automatically gets a half. Now, when, if you don't have a will, what happens? Well, if you don't have a will and you die, your property goes according to the, according to the law, the law spells out exactly who gets what. So let's take it from the top. Let's assume you don't have a will and you die. Well, the law says that your wife's going to get half. Actually, your wife gets $50,000 plus half of everything you have. 
and the rest of it is divided between your children. If you don't have a wife and you only have children, everything goes to your children equally. If you don't have a wife and you don't have children, then it goes to your brothers and sisters. If you don't have brothers and sisters, it goes to your nieces and nephews. If you don't have nieces and nephews, then it goes to cousins. If you don't have cousins, then it goes to the state, and that's what happens. So many times, if you don't have a will, property is going to go in a way that you don't necessarily want it to go. So that's why, for the most part, people should always have a will. Now, a will not only says how people are going to get your property. When I say property, I don't necessarily mean a house. I mean anything you own. A will also lets you specify who's going to take care of little children, assuming you have minor children, if you pass on. So if you pass on, you have children and little ones, who's going to be their guardians? And a will lets you specify who it is. Basically, a will will say that if I pass on and my children are under 18, my brother or whoever you say is going to be their guardian. If you don't have that in a will, then the court's going to decide who that person's going to be. And that may not be what you want. So it's very important for everybody to have a will. It doesn't matter whether you have a dollar or a million dollars. Unless you have a will, somebody else is going to make decisions that you don't necessarily want. Now, people make up wills, and only an original will is signed. And I have this all the time. People come in, so-and-so died, and they have a copy of a will. Copies of wills are meaningless. If you lose the original, you don't have a will. Nothing will replace it. And I say that to people all the time because I make up wills and people ask for copies. And I try to say all the time, only the original counts. And the reason for this is simple. When you sign the original will, let's assume you change your mind. You don't want your will. All you do is rip it up. So under the law, the law says, well, if we can't find your original will, we're going to figure that whoever made it up didn't want it and he ripped it up. Okay, so I just passed that out to everybody so that they know. A will is fairly simple. It doesn't list all your property. A will may say something like, if I die, I want my wife to get everything that I own. If my wife dies before me or the two of us die together in an accident, then I want it to all go to my children equally. The will will also say who's going to be in charge of this. The person in charge is called an executor. So the will will say, I appoint my wife as the executor. If my wife dies before me, then I appoint one of my children as the executor. It's as simple as that. It doesn't have to list what you own. Many times a will will say, I leave everything to my wife. If my wife dies, I have three children. I give child one 20%, child two 60%, and the other child the balance. It could be any formula that you want. Okay, so that's pretty simple. If I have any questions, you know, rather than wait till the end, as I'm going along and you want to ask, just raise your hand and we can answer them. So hopefully that's clear on what a will is. Now, the next thing besides a will is something called a durable power of attorney. Now, a power of attorney is basically a piece of paper that lets someone else do what you could do. Now, there are a lot of misconceptions about powers of attorney. And again, what I'm saying are stories that I hear and people that have come to my office over the years. Sometimes people say, I don't need a power of attorney. My, my son or my daughter is on all my bank accounts, so I don't need that. Or sometimes they say, well, everything is in both our names, so we don't need a power of attorney. A lot of times, <coughs> people are afraid to make a power of attorney because they think, well, if I do, that means that whoever I give it to, they're going to run my life. They're going to decide what I'm going to have and what I'm not going to have. It doesn't really work that way. Here's how a power of attorney works, and I'm going to have to use an example. Let's assume that someone lives by themselves, a widow or a widower, and that person has a stroke and is unable to carry on his affairs, and that person needs, let's assume, health care. Well, one of the things we'll get to later is if that person's house is in his name, it's got to be taken out of his name. So in order to do that, the only person that could do that would be him. If he's unable to sign his name to get the house out of his name, it can only be then done by the courts. And that involves the courts appointing guardians, and it gets very, very expensive. If instead that person had a power of attorney saying his son can sign his name in the event he couldn't, it's real simple. The power of attorney lets him sign his name, 
and transfer his property. I, mean, I use that just as a simple example. But without a power of attorney, if you're unable to sign your name for any reason, then the courts are going to decide who's going to handle your affairs, who's going to be your guardian. So again, like the will, you make up the will, you decide how things are going to be. Same thing with the power of attorney. If you don't have one, the court's going to decide who's in charge of you. The next thing we're going to talk about is a living will and a health care proxy. Now, they kind of go hand in hand. Let me <clears throat> try to explain each one. Some misconceptions. Sometimes people think, well, if I get sick, my wife can make any decisions if I go to the hospital. Or sometimes people tell me, I already have one. I signed the paper at the hospital. Other people say, I don't want one of those because if I sign one of those, they're going to pull a plug on me. None of those things are true. First of all, the purpose of a, there's two parts. A living will is a paper that you sign that basically says, in legal terms, if I get sick and I can't make decisions, and I'm in a condition where I'm not going to get better, I'm going to be brain dead. I don't want to be kept alive artificially. I don't want to have feeding tubes. I don't want to have this, or I don't want to have that. <coughs> and if I can't make those decisions because I'm physically unable, I'm designating someone else to make them for me. So the first part is the living will. The health care proxy is saying, if I can't make it, my son or my wife or whoever it is can make it for me. That doesn't mean that whoever I give it to can do whatever they want. They have to do whatever I said in my living will. Now, many times people may decide, well, if this happens, I do want a feeding tube. I do want this. Well, whatever it is, that person has to honor your wishes, and he's able to do so with the health care proxy. If you don't have that, unfortunately, what then happens is the hospital makes decisions for you, which may or may not be what you want. We all probably remember those cases with Karen Ann Quinlan, and they kept these people alive for no good reason forever and ever. Well, those all happened because there was no one that was authorized to make those decisions for them. So, again, that's the purpose of a living will and a health care proxy, okay? It lets you say what kind of treatment I'm going to get, and if I can't decide, if I can't make the decision, someone else can. Now, when you sign one of these and you're in the hospital, it doesn't mean that your wife or your husband or whoever can make decisions. If you're able to talk, you're the one who makes decisions. It's just when you're unconscious and you can't, and someone says, well, what do we, the, he's not going to get better. He's not expected to live more than a week. What do you want to do? Do you want to put him on a respirator? Do you want to do this, that, and the other thing? That enables that person to do that. Without that, the hospital is going to decide, and nine chances out of ten, they're going to do all the extraordinary measures to keep you alive as long as they can. And uh, in many situations, that isn't what you want. So those are the four basic papers that everybody should have. The will, <clears throat> the durable power of attorney, the health care proxy, and the uh, living will. Now, one of the questions that sometimes comes up is what are fees? Many lawyers go to seminars, they'll say, well, I can't tell you the fee, I'll let you know when you come in. I'm not like that, I'm above board. This is what the fee is. For a husband and wife to have all those documents that I just described, the will, the health care proxy, the living will, power of attorney, it's $500 for both. Or if there's only a husband, it's $250, the other is $250. People say, why are your fees so low? Because I choose them to be low. I try to be fair, okay? God's been good to me. Frankly, I'm very grateful. I don't try to bleed people. I try to be honest with people. But on the other hand, I have to be compensated as well. So that's my fee for that, okay? And... Uh, that settles that part. Now, the next question that sometimes comes up where people ask me is, well, if I die, what about taxes, okay? Do I have to pay income taxes? Do I have to pay, what do I have to pay when I inherit money? First of all, there are no income taxes when someone dies and the person inherits money. So if someone died and they had a million dollars and they left it all to you, you don't pay any taxes on that million dollars. However, the estate, the person that died may have to pay estate taxes. Now, the laws have been recently changed, and there are two estate taxes. There's a federal and there's a New York estate tax. Right now, under the federal estate tax law, there's an exemption of $5 million for a husband and $5 million for a wife. 
So as a practical matter for most people, there would be no estate tax unless it was over $10 million. Now, New York, the state of New York, has an inheritance tax, which has an exemption of $1 million for each person. But whatever a husband leaves to the wife or vice versa, there is no estate tax. So depending on someone's circumstances, there possibly could be a New York estate tax if you were leaving more than $2 million to someone other than your wife. And again, there are ways to minimize those taxes as well, which we're not going to talk about tonight, but I just want to give you some general information so you know the story about what estate taxes are. So before I continue, any questions at all about anything I've said so far? Okay, I'm trying to keep it simple. Now, besides all of these documents, some of us may have heard the word trust, talk about estates and trusts, and what's a trust? Okay, a trust is simply an agreement where I give you my ring. I say, listen, hold my ring. When I die, give my ring to my son. I'm trusting you to hold my ring and do what I say when I die. That's the concept of a trust. I take some property. It could be a house. It could be a, an article of jewelry. It could be a stock. And I say, I'm giving you this stock, not for you to keep, to hold in a trust. And when I pass away, this is what I want you to do with it. That's essentially what a trust is. And this is done by a legal agreement that you set up saying, I'm setting up the trust, I'm putting my house in the trust, or my stocks in the trust, whatever it might be, and this is how I want it distributed. The person you designate to be in charge, the trustee, signs the paper and agrees to do it. So it's a legally binding agreement. When you pass away, it's not up to him to then take it and keep it for himself. So that's the concept of a trust. Now, there are many different kinds of trusts. So I'm just going to try to talk about some of the more common ones. First of all, there are trusts that are called revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts. These are the differences. A revocable trust basically says, I'm going to take my house and I'm going to put it in a trust. When I die, I want my house sold and divided between everybody. This trust is revocable. What does that mean? It means that's what I'm doing today, but I could change my mind tomorrow and revoke it. I now own my house back. It's in my name, and that's the end of it. What is the advantage of a revocable trust? Well, the advantage is, to some extent, if you died and everything was in a trust, you really don't need a will because everything is going to go the way you said in a trust. Now. Unfortunately, you'll see a lot of ads that talk about avoid probate, put your property in a revocable trust. That is, in my opinion, very foolish advice. Avoiding probate is not a problem. Probate in the state of New York is very simple, and it's not inordinately expensive. Probate, all the war stories we hear about probates are in certain states, like California, that has very, very high probate fees. So as a result, they advertise or they tout that everybody should have a trust to avoid probate. The disadvantages of setting up a trust is they're expensive. Okay, they're not cheap. Unlike the cost for wills, trusts go into the thousands. And they don't really, a revocable trust doesn't really protect <coughs> anything. All it does is, quote, avoids probate. But let's assume you had a house and you put your house in a trust. But now you have bank accounts that are not in a trust. Well, you still need a will in order to decide who's going to get your house. So it is not a solution, in my opinion, to any problem, a revocable trust. And I'm only mentioning it so everybody knows what it is. Now, an irrevocable trust is a different story. An irrevocable trust, which I'll talk about in a little while, is basically the same with one big exception. Once you do it, you can't change it. It's irrevocable. And that's usually used to protect your property in the event you get sick, God forbid you have to go into a nursing home, or you need health care, or things like that. Now, the next kind of trust is something called a special needs trust. Now, how does that come about? Well, I've heard people say, oh, I have a disabled son. He gets SSI. So I can't really leave him anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm leaving it all to my daughter, and don't worry, I know she'll take care of him. Okay, famous last words. <laughs> well, now, the real thing, most parents want to make sure that both the kids get the benefit of it. So how do they do it? There's something called a special needs trust. 
which the law approves and the government approves, which basically lets you set up a trust for a disabled child that's getting government benefits, and he doesn't lose those benefits. The money you put in the trust can be used to supplement his needs, which means to help him have a better life, however, you dis however the trustee decides to use it. So it enables you to provide for someone disabled and at the same time that person not lose their benefits. So that's what's called a special needs trust. The next kind of trust is a spendthrift trust. Now, I had people come in and say, you know, I have two kids, they're both great. I really want to treat them equally, but you know what? My son's got a drug problem. He's good today, but God knows what he's going to do tomorrow. If I leave it all to him, he may blow it all. So I'm going to leave it to my other son, and he'll take care of me. Okay, that's not going to happen, or it may not happen. So the question is, how do I leave money to a child who isn't good with money, may blow it, and at the same time, I want to treat him fairly? Well, that's done with a trust called a special, uh, called a spendthrift trust. And the way that basically works is child number one gets his share of whatever it is. He gets his half. The other child, we'll call the problem child, his money goes into a trust. And you appoint someone who's then going to decide, dole out his money in a way that he's making sure he's getting his money, still his, but he's not blowing it. So let's assume that child had $100,000 in the trust fund. Well, he's not going to be able to ask the trustee, you know what? I want 80,000, I'm gonna do some bizarre thing. The trustee, whoever you appoint, would obviously be telling him no. So it's a safeguard. On the same token, the money in that trust can't be used for anyone other than him. So it's kind of a monitor on his money, a way of protecting his inheritance. And that's basically a spendthrift trust. Now the last kind of trust I'm gonna talk about is something called the bloodline trust, and that's kind of recent. And this is the way this scenario works. I've had people come in and they go, you know what? I'm leaving everything to my son, but I can't stand his wife. And my biggest fear is if he dies, that blah, blah, blah is going to get his money. She's going to get remarried and it's going to go. I don't want it to happen. I want my grandchildren to have it. How do I do it? And there is a way of doing it. And that's another kind of trust, which is called a bloodline trust. And the way that works is basically this, excuse me, this way. Let's assume we have two children. We leave their shares in a trust. The trust is going to say that so-and-so is the trustee of it, and all the money's theirs. Whatever they want, they could take out as they need it. When they die and when they're gone, whatever's left in that trust doesn't go to the wife, goes to my grandchildren. So by doing this, with this kind of trust, the, the, uh, the daughter-in-law or son-in-law, as the case may be, isn't getting your money. That money, whatever's left, is going to go to your grandchildren. And that's what's called this bloodline trust. So that's kind of it in terms of wills and estates and trusts. Any questions up to this point? Okay, now we'll move on to the subject of elder law. Question. Now, elder, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. If you have a will that states mm -hmm. what you just said, right? You know, we, 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 you wouldn't need to trust them. No, that's right. The will states that. We, what I'm describing when I talk yeah. about a bloodline trust, these are trusts that are that are written into a will. Okay. Okay. It's not a separate paper. This is something written into the will. Okay. So your will, for instance, let's assume would say, if I die, everything goes to my wife. If my wife dies before me, it goes to my two children. But child number, but my two children aren't to get the money outright. Their share is going to go into a trust, and so-and-so is going to be the trustee. Whatever he feels that they need, he will give them. If my child dies and there's money left in that trust, it goes to my grandchildren. So that means that the daughter-in-law or son-in-law, as the case might be, has no claim on that money. Okay, so it's written into a will. Now, one of the subjects I forgot to mention before, as I said, if you have a will, it dis the will does not override everything you did. Sometimes people make up a will and isn't going to do what they want. Let me explain. If you have a bank account, and on your bank account, you have $100,000, and the bank account says it's in trust for your daughter. And then in your will, you say, I have three kids, I want them all to get it equally. Well, that will will not pass any 
of the property in that bank account because that bank account is named the daughter as the beneficiary. So the will is only going to pass property that's only in your name alone. So the daughter's going to get the $100,000 because her name's on the bank account and the other children aren't going to share in that. Now, I'm using a bank account as an example, but it could be life insurance. You have a life insurance policy that was taken out years ago and the beneficiary is maybe one of your children. And now you have more than one child and they're not on the, on the life insurance as a beneficiary. Well, they're not, even though you write in your will you want it equal, it's not going to matter. The beneficiary designation will override that. So just something to keep in mind. Now, the next thing I, I started to mention is elder law. Elder law is no different than younger law, okay? It's only that as you get older, there are needs that older people have to deal with that you didn't have to deal with when you were young. And the biggest concern about most people is if I get sick and I wind up in a nursing home or I need home care, what's going to happen? They're going to take my house. It's going to cost me a fortune. What do I do? How do I pay for a nursing home? How do I pay for this? Well, obviously, you could pay for it yourself if you have the funds to do it. Or if you have long-term care insurance, that might take care of it. But most people don't have enough money to pay nursing homes. Nursing homes today cost you know, over $12,000 a month. And uh, long-term care insurance, depending on what age you buy it at, is very, very expensive. And most of the policies of long-term care don't really cover everything. There are a lot of limitations on it. So for most people, what they generally try to do is become eligible for Medicaid, to let Medicaid pay for this. And let me back up. There is two things, two government programs, Medicare and Medicaid. When you're 65, we all get Medicare. We don't get Medicaid. Medicare does not pay for nursing homes. Medicare does not pay for home health care. It only pays for rehabilitative care. So if you had an operation and you need some rehab for a month or so, and you're in a nursing home for rehab, it'll take care of that. But it does not take care of long-term home care, long-term nursing home, or long-term home care. The only, prob the only program that does that is Medicaid. Now, Medicaid is a program run by the state, and every state has different rules. In order to get Medicaid to pay for nursing home care or home care, you basically have to be poor. You have to have very limited assets. You're only allowed to have less than $20,000 in assets, and if it's a husband and wife, you really can't have more than about $1,500 in income. So, what do people do to protect their property and still get Medicaid? Well, that's where the irrevocable trusts come in. Now, the irrevocable trust, as you remember, the only difference between that and the revocable is once you do it, you can't change it. Now, for most people, their real concern is their house. It's usually a major asset. So, if someone gets sick and is going to wind up in a nursing home, or even if they're not in a nursing home, and today many people live out their years in their own house, and they have home care. Some of you may be familiar with it, where nurses and home aides come into the house to take care of people either on a living basis or so many hours a day. Now, both of those programs, okay, allow you to still have a house. They're not going to, quote, take your house. They're not going to force you to sell your house. But what they will do is they will tally how much your care has cost, whether it's in the nursing home or whether it's in your own house. And they will file a lien, which is like a mortgage against your house. So that when you pass away and your house is ready to be sold, if your house was worth 500000 it may be, depending on how long you receive benefits, that you have liens owed to the state of three or 400000 And worse than that, sometimes your house could have no value because of all the money that the state now wants to be repaid. So we we'll go back to the question, so how do I protect my house? The way we protect the house is we take the house and we create a trust, an irrevocable trust. And what the trust is basically saying is, I am putting my house in a trust. However, there are some stipulations. The first stipulation is, while I'm alive, nobody could sell my house unless I say okay. When I'm gone, then my house can be sold and divided up however I say. Now, that's called an irrevocable trust or a Medicaid trust. Once you do that, you 
and then start receiving Medicaid, they can't do anything in terms of filing liens against your house or forcing a sale because technically you don't own your house. You have the right to live there for the rest of your life and some other rights, but the house is owned by the trust. So that's the usual way that people protect their house. Now, sometimes people say to me, well, if I put my house in the trust, am I going to lose my senior citizen's exemption or my veteran's exemption for real estate taxes? And the answer is no. You don't lose any of those exemptions. You still have complete control of your house. If your son or your daughter is the trustee, they can't sell it unless you agree. If you decide, I put my house in the trust and now I want to buy another house, can you sell your house? The answer is yes. You could still sell your house. The new house you buy would not be in your name, but would be in the name of the trust and be under the same conditions that you originally set up. Now, besides having control by putting your home in a house, yep. Just a quick question. How soon before you start receiving care does your house? Yeah, I'm going to go through that okay. in a second. Okay. Now, besides the fact that you have what's called a life estate, which means your house can't be sold unless you say so, you also have some other things in the trust agreement that you could change. You name who your beneficiaries are. Let's assume it's your three children. You have the right at any time to decide, well, I want to eliminate one of my kids. You tick me off, I don't want to leave them anything, or I want to give this one more, or this one's less. You can always change that. What you can't do is say, I want to end the whole trust and put that house back in my name. That you can't do. So generally, the Medicaid Asset Protection Trust serves that purpose. Now the next thing we go to is, can I do this today and then go into a nursing home tomorrow and be home free? The answer to that is no. There's something called look back periods. And here's the way that works. If I take my house and, I train, let's, and I'm using the house as an example that could apply to anything. I have to go into a nursing home tomorrow, so I take my house and I put it in a trust today, and then I go into a nursing home. Will that work? The answer is no. Because for nursing home care, there's what's called a five-year look back, which means if I transfer my house and put it in a trust and I have to go into a nursing home, there has to at least have been five years that passed from when I did it to when I got Medicaid for a nursing home. But, but the, big, the big advantage in New York is that that does not apply if instead of going to a nursing home, I want to stay in my own home. A person had a stroke and they need someone now to take care of them, and Medicaid has that program, there is no look back for that. So I can take my house, transfer it out of my, excuse me, name, put it in a trust and get Medicaid tomorrow. My parents who were long gone, that's exactly what we had done for them. We took their house, we took it out of their name, we put it in a trust. For five, their five years before they died, they both had 24-hour home care, and. The house was never, uh, never in question. There was never any liens or anything else filed against it. So the five-year look-back period does not apply for home care, but it does for nursing home care. So that's essentially it in terms of uh, Medicaid 